Our project was done by Bernard, Pongming, Christina, and Nathaniel about affinity chromatography. Affinity chromatography specifically refers to the laboratory technique used to separate mixture. Affinity chromatography is an idea centered on the liquid chromatography by means of reversible interactions between biologically related agents and target biological macromolecules. The first example of affinity chromatography to be documented was developed by Emil Starkenstein in 1910. He utilized the natural interactions between the enzyme alpha amylase and the substrate starch to create a column that bound alpha amylase to insoluble starch. Not only was this the first example of affinity chromatography, but also one of the earliest examples of a separation in which liquid chromatography was used with an enzyme or a protein. As the next two decades passed by, a major issue arose with the support of what we know as a matrix. Though the support was easy to prepare, the binding properties were not long-term due to the gradual loss of the binding agent. A critical advancement took place in 1951 when Campbell, Lucher, and Lerman immobilized bovine serum albumin, or BSA, through an activated form of cellulose. With their results, they were able to isolate anti-BSA antibodies in a serum sample from rabbits that had previously been injected and immunized with BSA. The next critical developments occurred in the mid-1960s. One of them was created by Jerton in 1964 with the development of beaded agarose. This was important because this support was more readily adaptable than cellulose when proteins and biopolymers were used for liquid chromatography. The next development happened in 1967 when a group of scientists developed a method known as cyanogen bromide immobilization method. This method allowed for a general and convenient means for combining peptides and proteins to polysaccharide based materials. Then a critical point happened in 1968 when another group of scientists coupled the beaded agarose development along with the cyanogen bromide immobilization method. This immobilized nuclease inhibitors to beaded agarose and allowed for several enzymes to be purified. By this new coupled method, the term affinity chromatography was birthed. From the histogram, the number of publications using the term affinity chromatography increased rapidly after 1968. There are still around 1300 affinity chromatography papers published during the last decade. Now with the widely spread concept of affinity chromatography, diversity in affinity ligands, immobilization method, and application provides inspiration in all fields of scientific research. We will look at some people who are using affinity chromatography right here in NC State. Please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Trino. My last name is Asensio Ibanez. I come originally from Mexico, but I've been in NC State for about 16 years, since 2001, in different capacities. My favorite thing to do here is to teach, but I also do research. I love teaching, basically. And I am in the Molecular and Structural Biochemistry Department, which is a pretty long name. It's an awesome department. And we do a lot of work with proteins. So what is your research? My main interest is in what is the interaction between a pathogen and a plant. And I work with the viruses that infect plants of a specific family. They are single-stranded DNA viruses and they are called Gemini viruses because when you look them in the electron microscope they really look like geminated particles and Gemini, Gemini means twins so they are called Gemini viruses because of that reason. But I'm extremely interested in the cell cycle and what is the host response to the virus. So I work in everything from understanding how the virus infects to how the plant responds to it and to produce plants that are resistant to the viruses. How do you use the chromatography in your research? Well, I use uh, affinity chromatography for several different purposes in my research. One of the things that we have done is um, we produced a clone. We inserted a viral gene in a bacterial plasma 
and we modify it to add some history details that will be easy to dig out when you put it in a complex mixture. So the first thing we did is was we produced it in um, E. coli and after the production we separated that by using a nickel salt, a nickel, nickel phase which separated whatever contained these histidines from the rest of the proteins. It included some other proteins that were not what we were our target proteins, but most of the protein obtained from it, it was one of these viral proteins that we were extremely interested in producing antibodies with. So we got the antibodies for those proteins, and then we used them for immunohistochemistry determination of where the virus was present. And what's your specific protocol? Any specific methods or um, techniques you use? <laughs> okay, so one of the things that we use is a resin that contains nickel and that it will have high affinity to the histidines that we put in the proteins that we are interested to dig out. Then we go and put the resin into a column like this that it will be variable depends on what's the amount of tissue you're going to be using. It could be a thinner longer, but you can also have very, very thick columns this big. Depends what you want to verify and the scale that of your interest. If you're looking for milligrams, micrograms, or you're looking for grams of protein, that's what will define this as well. And also the source of your protein. Since we're using bacterial extracts, we don't need so much, and we grow about 250 to 500 milliliters of bacteria. Then we sonicate that, we make a lysis on the bacteria, and then we pass the output through the column. And if the protein is present and the nickel will work properly and the buffer has the proper pH, then the protein will bind to the column and then you can wash it. And to elute your protein after washing, you can also use different approaches. You can use imidazole, for instance, that they will exchange and make your protein come out from the column. But sometimes even changes in pH will allow you to elute the protein. And you collect it, I don't have it here, but you collect it in a fraction collector. Otherwise, you spend days here just stripping and counting drops and closing tubes, which I have done. <laughs> but the thing is that it's really a very interesting um, protocol. And one of the main things is that you get a high purity of your protein. And that was something that we really liked to obtain. I am a professor of physics. I've been in NC State for 12 years. And what is your research here? We do single molecule biophysics research. We use tools of fluorescence microscopy to look at protein DNA interaction. And how do you specifically use affinity chromatography in your research? We attach fluorescent labels to proteins through cysteine engineering and so we make lots of recombinant proteins where we engineer cysteines at different locations and we express these in E. coli and we purify proteins with affinity chromatography. Can you describe a typical procedure using a, a chromatography? Uh, we express proteins that have affinity tags. The most common are success tags to match with um, nickel NCA matrix binding. Uh, and we also use uh, GST attached proteins and glutathione media. And so when the proteins are expressed in E. coli, we lyse the cells and we uh, pellet insoluble materials and then run it over an affinity matrix uh, to bind our protein of interest and then elute it from the matrix after washing it. In this specific example, um, what is your matrix? This is just an agarose uh, nickel NTA. Okay, and what is, what's the ligand? Uh, we are purifying a DNA repair protein. Uh, from a different species that's expressed in E. coli and it contains a six histidine tag. Gotcha. So you said you're using um, 
gravity flow here as opposed to what are this is a uh, this is most of our work is just a, a gravity flow columns um, washing by hand and alluding in imidazole solutions and all, you said in all solutions in imidazole and imidazole so, to release the succinic from the neglentia so what's some downstream that experiments after you've purified your protein after, um, through once we purify the protein, we um, label it the fluorescent dyes, and then uh, we construct different experiments in a fluorescence microscope where we look at um, interactions of these proteins with DNA substrates. So, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tony Planchard. I'm an assistant professor in biological sciences. Okay. Um, what is your research? My research is uh, involved in understanding how the environment interplays with genetics to cause human disease and we use uh, animal models like the zebrafish to better understand that. But we also use cell culture models and other in vitro models for that particular type of research. Can you describe how affinity uh, chromatography works into your research? Yeah, so one of the projects that we're working on right now is to understand uh, elements of the genome that are bound by transcription factors and how those transcription factors recognize the binding sites in the DNA. So we will start by making a probe, a DNA probe, uh, that has that sequence that we suspect might be bound by a transcription factor, and we'll conjugate it to a small molecule like biotin. And then we will uh, adhere that biotin labeled um, oligo to a streptavidin column uh, and then flow nuclear extract from different uh, cells or fish or fish lines that have been either genetically manipulated or exposed to different environmental compounds uh, and look at, at the effect of these exposures on the nuclear protein profile and also see which ones bind uh, to these particular sequences. And then once we've done that, we uh, will cross-link the nuclear proteins to these DNA fragments, and then we will wash them off the column by adding excess biotin so that we can displace them from streptavidin. And then we will subject them to proteomic analysis to identify the protein. So this um instrument here, is that what you use for? Uh, this would be one type of instrument. This is a low pressure chromatography instrument. Uh, we will use this mostly for size exclusion chromatography, uh, but we can also use it for uh, affinity chromatography as well. Hello, um, I'm Gong Fang Hu. I'm a fourth year graduate student working in Dr. Lindsay's lab, Department of Chemistry, and State University. So here um, is our uh, lab, which is a kind of messy, but this is a typical organic lab. <laughs> Here we do organic uh, chemistry research on the, based on the porphyrin, which is the, uh, the backbone of the uh, hemoglobin in your blood. So can you expand on your research, exactly what that is? Yeah, so, um, well, the story starts from the green leaves. So, you know, green leaves are, are harnessed to the sunlight and generate carbon dioxide, no, sorry, generate oxygen and the carbohydrates. We call them photosynthesis. So there's a part of the research in chemistry called artificial photosynthesis. Here we uh, artificially make some molecules, especially organic or inorganic molecules. They can do the same job with the green leaves, like uh, harvest the light and do uh, uh, oxygen generation and uh, carbohydrate generation absorb those carbon dioxide or something like that. That's my uh, uh, research focus on. So here we design and synthesize all kinds of large molecules, including the porphyrin, multi porphyrin arrays, that can be applied to this kind of uh, purpose. So that's what we're doing. But basically, you design and synthesize molecule, and then you characterize the molecule with these kind of uh, photophysical um, measurements, like absorption spectrum, you know, uh, fluorescence spectrum, or something like that. So that can tell you something. Yeah. And how does affinity, excuse me, how does size exclusion chromatography apply to your research? Yeah, so uh, the reason we use these because uh, you know our target molecule become pretty large, which has a you know molecular weight around three thousand to five thousand. That's a pretty large for an uh, organic molecule. But the good thing is the reaction for, for uh, to form the uh, target molecule is pretty simple. 
you have two uh, building blocks, building block molecule, which has a molecular weight like uh, 15,000, uh, sorry, 1,500, and a plus of 1,500. You combine them together, and boom, you got a 3,000 gram. So if you, so this is a mixture. If you want to separate your desired product, which has a 3,000 molecular weight, from your starting material or any other kind of byproduct, they actually have a very different, you know, in size. So that's why we can use a size exclusion, you know, from chromography to separate them. Both the uh, products or some, you know, residue of the starting material or some byproducts or some overproduced, you know, material or something. But they are, you know, very different in molecular weight or in size if you want to put it like that way. So that's why we use the SEC columns. Now can you run us through a uh, basic procedure using this and mm -hmm. explain what your matrix is and, um, and the beads and the differences in these columns? Okay. So all of these are actually the same type of beads. We uh, we bought we bought it from the BioRat. If you can take, I don't know if you can do that. But, um, yeah, that's a the the, the grade is actually uh, for different kind of resolution. Some of the grade is higher. You can resolve a larger molecule, but with a lower resolution. But some of the grade is lower. You can um, you can only use for a very small tiny molecule, but the resolution is extremely high. So the difference, they're all polymers, basically a polystyrene polymers. They're cross-linked polystyrene, which means they're gonna form network into the beads. But the, the different of these uh, columns, they have a different size. The pore size of the polymers are different. So some of the molecule, if the molecule is smaller than the pore size, it's gonna stuck into the molecule. But if it's larger, it's gonna avoid getting into the polymer. It's gonna leak through the edge of the, the column. So which one? So this is going to, you know, coming down from the edge of the column, the wall of the column, and coming down pretty quick. That's why for typically SEC columns, you can have a larger molecule go first, and smaller molecules go, you know, in the in the in the in the background. 